awesome. All right, we're gonna give everyone a few minutes to join. Uh, thanks so much for coming and uh, we'll start the presentation right around noon, maybe a minute after. Right. Thanks again for joining everyone. I'm just watching uh, the numbers come in. Uh, we will get started right around noon or a minute after. Hope everyone is enjoying this beautiful day. We appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I, my clock shows 1158, so we will give uh, folks another couple minutes to join. Uh, we'll get started right after the hour. Just for some added professionalism, I'll use my uh, virtual background for while we're assembling. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. <laughs> And Philip, you were saying yours is an official official background. Apparently, I was told today that we have officially approved uh, Zoom backgrounds, so I thought I would try one out. That's very exciting. Uh, mine is, I often get questions about the painting behind me. It is by a local artist, Alicia Lachance. And you will notice her work, which this is called New Village. Um, uh, 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 the original, I think, of this is a huge mosaic as you're exiting the terminal, either terminal, the main terminals at Lambert, you actually walk over this mosaic. So the next time you all are in Lambert Airport, uh, look down and you will see a familiar work of art. I'll look forward to the time when I actually get to fly somewhere <laughs> and that opportunity presents itself. So. Exactly. Very few people are... <coughs> Uh, enjoying this artwork right now. Although I did have a conversation over the weekend in which my eight-year-old daughter told me that I could erase all the travel apps from my uh, iPad because I wasn't going to be going anywhere anytime soon. She makes her point. Uh, let's see, we uh, have a great number of folks already uh, online, but I'm going to give everyone just another minute. Uh, to join and then we will get started. Thank you all again uh, for taking some time to uh, spend with prepare.ai and the Institute of Informatics today. I will give everyone one more minute. Dave, where did your background go? Oh, I don't know. Should I, should I throw it back up for the duration? I mean, my only concern, Dave, is that it looks like you're being attacked by a virus particle. Yeah. So. <laughs> nice. I like the uh, the Zoom ones that come with with it now. They're, they're uh, very calming. This yes. one's this one's pretty nice. Aspirational. <laughs> Again, someday, someday. <laughs> right. All right. Well, uh, we can go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, this is our first in a series of free webinars presented by Prepare.ai, a St. Louis-based 501c3 whose mission is to increase collaboration around and access to AI and other fourth industrial revolution technologies uh, in order to advance the human experience. Um, I'm Cindy Teasdale. I'm the executive director of Prepare.ai. I'm here today with my colleague, Dave Castanero, who is a co-founder of Prepare. Um, as well as the Chief Data Officer for um, Capacity, one of our sister organizations, and um, Philip Payne, who we will introduce uh, in just a couple of minutes. So just some uh, quick housekeeping. Um, many of you may know PREPARE from the annual conferences we've put on um, in St. Louis since 2018. Our 2020 conference was actually supposed to take place uh, last week. We would all be together a week ago today. Um, and Philip was going to be one of our speakers. Um, we are really hoping to reschedule the event uh, for early October and we will be spreading the word as soon as those new dates have been confirmed. 
In the meantime, we are so thrilled to be hosting a series of free webinars on how organizations um, in St. Louis and beyond are using technology to combat the coronavirus pandemic and related challenges. Uh, and we hope that they provide value to our community. So again, we're so excited to have everyone here today. Um, our second webinar will take place uh, two weeks from today on May 12th. Uh, the topic is the ethical implications of AI in the age of COVID and will feature three phenomenal public health experts and um, medical ethics ex experts from St. Louis University. Uh, please check our social media or our website. We will also be sending a link to the next webinar in the follow-up to this webinar. So um, it is just like this one, entirely free and open to the public. So feel free to, um, we encourage you to share it with folks in your community and in your networks. And now I am happy to hand things off to Dave Costanero, who will introduce Philip. Great, thanks for the introduction, Cindy. Uh, as Cindy mentioned, Prepare.ai works with multiple members of the tech community uh, on how they're utilizing artificial intelligence and other fourth industrial revolution technologies. Uh, about three months ago, our friends at Doherty Business Solutions introduced us to Philip Payne. Uh, he's the founding director of the Institute for Informatics, and that's I2, uh, at Washington University's School of Medicine in St. Louis. Uh, so I2 works to provide an academic and professional home for informatics science and practice. It spans the School of Medicine, as well as partnerships with the School of Engineering and Applied Science, the Institute for Public Health, the Brown School, the Olin School of Business, the Health Systems Innovation Lab, and Center for Clinical Excellence at BJC Healthcare, and the Cortex Innovation Community. So rich, vibrant network of uh, really cool organizations there. Uh, I2 engages in innovative research, workforce development, and informatics service delivery, targeting a variety of critical areas of need. Philip was slated to speak at Prepare 2020 conference uh, before the coronavirus pandemic hit. He's the first person we thought of when we decided to offer some free programming to the community during this public health crisis. So we called him up and arranged this webinar. Uh, Philip's gonna spend about 20 minutes or so talking about how I2 has been involved in the St. Louis region's planning and response to COVID-19. Uh, and then the last portion of the hour will be a Q&A. We wanna hear from, from everybody here talking, what's top of your mind? Uh, feel free to ask questions through the session. There's a Q&A feature at the bottom of the, the Zoom screen. So that's where we'll be kind of looking at and curating and pulling questions together. Uh, we'll be combining, com, compiling them and combining them. And then we'll do that in, in a session follow-up here. But uh, yeah, so without further ado, Philip, why don't you take it away and uh, let us know what's going on. Great, thanks Dave and Cindy. I really appreciate the kind introduction and I'm really happy to be here talking with this group today. Uh, about a topic that quite honestly uh, is the uh, sort of prime example of the practice of informatics in a way that, you know, even a few uh, weeks ago, we might not have imagined that we would have been involved in. So uh, I promise that this uh, talk is almost entirely about data and analytics and AI. Uh, and there is not going to be a pop quiz at the end, but I am going to take two or three slides and just talk about a little bit of biology because it does anchor many of the uh, problems that we are trying to tackle when we think about this intersection of informatics and the COVID epidemic. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the fact that COVID is caused by a type of virus, which is known as a coronavirus. Uh, and coronaviruses are quite common, right? We often encounter them in our daily lives. They manifest in relatively mild respiratory diseases. Uh, although occasionally we see more uh, virulent uh, coronaviruses such as SARS and MERS and now what we see with COVID. Um, the thing about coronaviruses is that they have been well understood for some time and they are very simple. And actually one of the sort of beauties of the coronavirus, if you think about it uh, in this uh, particular way, is that it is so simple and so resilient. It also is what makes it so challenging to both diagnose and treat, not to mention build uh, potential uh, vaccines for. Now, COVID-19 is actually the disease state that results from being infected with what is known as the 2019 novel coronavirus or 2000 NCOV. Um, and this is an interesting version of the coronavirus because in fact, it behaves in a few ways that we've not seen before. 
Um, many of you have probably heard about uh, the fact that there are very specific proteins on the surface of the coronavirus that interact with binding sites uh, in the human lung and other tissues in a way that is uh, both surprising and will likely lead to sort of the best therapeutic targets that we'll be able to develop for the disease over time. But I think one of the, the great challenges in the near to medium term is in fact the heterogeneity of the clinical course of COVID-19. Um, this is an infographic from a really nice article that was published in The Lancet uh, not too long ago that sort of describes the clinical course of various symptoms uh, that individuals infected with the novel coronavirus experience over a period of about 20 to 22 days. And in this case, separates those who survive versus those that do not survive uh, the disease. And in particular, what you will see uh, for those individuals who are not surviving uh, COVID-19 uh, is an onset of a number of symptoms that are quite severe, including acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS, as well as a variety of acute injuries to various organ systems throughout the body. And that's really what we're challenged by when treating those most acutely ill uh, patients with COVID, which is this sort of sudden cascade of multi-system organ failure, especially for those patients in the ICU. And it's one of the reasons why data analytics and AI, see, I promised that this wasn't going to be about biology, uh, is so incredible incredibly important because we need to be able to identify those individuals who are going to experience this most severe form of COVID and intervene early and often so that we can maximize their chances of survival, especially during this time period where we don't always have the best therapeutic or even diagnostic strategies for the disease. Now, one of the things that is uh, particularly challenging in addressing uh, sort of the variable clinical course of COVID is what is really a rapidly evolving evidence base as to how we will diagnose and treat uh, this particular disease condition. Um, I think it's actually a testament to the way in which the academic uh, world can adapt to a new challenge that we have been publishing uh, evidence at a rate that's never been seen before. Uh, in the past, scientific papers or data sets that might have taken weeks or months to show up in the peer-reviewed literature are now being published in, you know, 48 or 72 hours. Um, that's really important as we seek to better understand this disease, and it builds the foundations for many of the analytic tasks that we undertake, um, but it also means that there is a diverse evidence base that we haven't even really fully understood or synthesized. And this includes everything from studies that tell us that there may be asymptomatic carriers of the disease that are circulating in the community and therefore that is why we see uh, such a uh, strong spread of the disease when it's uncontrolled uh, to questions around sort of the role of immune response in those patients that experience the most uh, severe symptoms in the ICU and whether or not that represents a set of therapeutic strategies to uh, fundamental questions about how do we even conduct uh, efficacious drug trials in light of such a uh, challenging and diverse disease state. And so it's both challenging us in terms of building the evidence base, but also helping us to think more critically. And it really does span this broad spectrum from how do we diagnose and test for this disease to what is the biomolecular phenotype, clinical presentations, how should we treat, and importantly, beyond that, population health and health policy and management issues issues that we have to undertake as we sort of adapt this new normal, because this uh, particular virus is probably going to be around for a while. Uh, some hypothesize that it may end up being not dissimilar to the way in which we approach seasonal influenza as we sort of evolve our therapeutic testing and vaccination strategies. Now, some of you may have visited uh, this dashboard, which is provided by Johns Hopkins University. I think it's a great example of uh, both an effort to put as much information into one screen that does not require scrolling, uh, but also to aggregate uh, information from a variety of sources. Now, since this talk is really about data and analytics, I want to begin by saying that what's fascinating about this dashboard and why the data is so powerful that is contained here is that it is drawn from multiple different sources, right? Uh, natural language processing that is applied to uh, the lay press, uh, as well as to scientific literature, public data sets that are reported by various population health management agencies, not to mention uh, more detailed or granular data from laboratories that conduct uh, clinical testing and the like. And all those data are being aggregated in real time to give us this sort of 
global view of the number of cases, how they are distributed, how many uh, deaths that we have seen, and the geospatial uh, spread of the disease. And this theme of needing to integrate and reason upon a large amount of diverse and highly dynamic data is probably the most important cross-cutting uh, challenge and opportunity presented in this near term as we use data and analytics approaches to tackle COVID. Now, I didn't want to just look at this from the uh, global perspective. So we have a similar platform provided by uh, the government of the state of Missouri that allows us to visualize this type of data um, at a county and metropolitan uh, area for our state. And as you can see, not surprisingly, in our particular instance, our clusters or sort of most intense regions of activity are in the St. Louis and Kansas City areas. Um, and you can actually see here a variety of visualizations that talk about sort of gender, age, and other dimensions that may be predictive of clinical outcome for these uh, patients. So that leads to sort of a set of five critical information and data analytic needs uh, that presented itself uh, about a month ago as we start to recognize sort of the challenge in front of us in managing this epidemic. Um, and broadly, they fall into the categories that are described here. The first is how do we build reasonable epidemiological models of this disease where there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of how it spreads and how it behaves so we can anticipate what our patient surge might be? How do we deploy resources? What types of patients do we anticipate seeing in the healthcare system? That also leads to a question around predictive modeling. Can we, in the absence of comprehensive diagnostic testing or knowledge of the biology of the disease, make a relatively educated guess using artificial intelligence techniques as to the likely outcome for a patient in front of us? If this patient's in the emergency department, do we need to send them to the ICU? Or could we send them home and monitor them through virtual care because they're likely to have more mild disease? And are there surrogate markers in the data that defines their demographics, exposure, behaviors, or clinical presentations that allow us to make that educated guess. Capacity planning is a big part of what we have to do as well. Do we have the right facilities, personnel, and supplies to address the near-term needs of our patient population? Uh, as a colleague of mine is uh, often prone to say, uh, the simplest form of precision medicine is just having the right provider in the right place at the right time, not necessarily sequencing patients or using more advanced technologies. And then thinking more broadly, how do we engage in population health management? Because the only way that we reopen our economy, that we allow for some return to normal between now and a future state in which we have better therapies and vaccines, is that we need to be able to monitor incidents of COVID in the community and intervene in very precise and rapid ways. So how do we find those signals in the community that will allow us to prevent spread of the disease? And then underpinning all this, how do we materialize in record time uh, the data infrastructure at the local, regional, national, and international levels required to achieve these sorts of end states? Now at Washington University and with our partners at BJC Healthcare, we were very fortunate that we had three very complementary groups that could come forward and work in a conjoint manner in order to address these challenges. The first is a group that's part of our health system, which is the BJC Center for Clinical Excellence that in more sort of conventional modes of operation focuses on things like operational reporting, analytics, and quality improvement for the entire health system. We have the Institute for Informatics that I lead that's primarily an informatics and data science research and development group that focuses more on the application of AI and knowledge-based systems to complex biomedical data sets. And we have a joint team between WashU and BJC known as the Epic One team that actually deploys our unified electronic health record that's used across the entire Washington University and BJC uh, health system. And this is a critical data infrastructure uh, platform for all of the things that I'm talking about today. And very early in this pandemic, we came together across the leaderships of uh, teams from these groups and said, we must work together if we're going to be able to have optimal outcomes for our patients and populations in light of this unprecedented challenge. So I'll give you an example of some of the use cases that we worry about on a day-to-day -day basis that leverage uh, data and analytics approaches. So the first is, can we develop more empiric approaches to identifying those patients where COVID testing can and should impact clinical management? Now we could spend the rest of this talk discussing sort of the relative availability and sort of strengths and weaknesses of various COVID testing modalities, but we're not going to do that because that's not the focus of today's talk. But what I will say is that testing is limited, although those limitations are getting better in our region. Um, the testing modalities are variable in their sensitivity and specificity depending on the type of patient and what we're seeking to do with that test. 
And it's not always available when a patient presents in the ED and is critically ill. So we need to find other features that we can predict the likely outcome for a patient and make a smart decision for that individual, even in light of missing or incomplete testing data. Because we don't have right now a point of care test that we can administer in 10 or 15 minutes that tells us definitively whether or not a patient is going to have a bad outcome not dissimilar from what we see in other respiratory viruses. So that's one example. A second example building on that is, what is the relative risk at a patient level? Can we anticipate the severity of disease and potential response to therapy so we can make a precise, optimal decision for how to take care of the patient in front of us? And again, this may be in light of incomplete testing day, data and an incomplete understanding of the biology and clinical course of the disease. So we're really, again, as I said earlier, using artificial intelligence to reason in what is arguably a fuzzy space around sort of the likely features that correlate with outcomes and do so in a dynamic way that's going to change over time as we see more patients and learn more about disease course. And then, as I alluded to earlier, another example is hospital surge planning. How do we make sure we have the beds, ventilators, dialysis machines, medications, and personnel that we need to tackle a disease surge at any point in time? And that requires prior planning to pre-position those resources in the system to make sure that we can, again, deliver safe and efficacious care to our populations that we serve. Now, I've talked with uh, Dave and Cindy about this before, but I'll share with you, I really conceptualize these problems as being not dissimilar to what happens in weather forecasting when we're considering the likely trajectory of a hurricane. So early on, when we know that there's a hurricane forming in the Atlantic and heading towards the eastern seaboard of the United States or towards the Gulf, we often collect a lot of data, data from uh, airplanes that are used for observing weather phenomena, from satellites, from sensors at the ocean surface level, and a variety of other uh, sources. And we will aggregate that data and use a variety of artificial intelligence and machine learning methods to predict based on prior behavior of other hurricanes, uh, what the likely course for that hurricane will be. And early on when we do that, those models tend to be quite divergent and heterogeneous. And that's where we get what is called the spaghetti uh, model, which is what you see here. Um, I believe that what we're facing with the COVID-19 uh, epidemic right now is entirely similar to that problem. We have incomplete knowledge and incomplete data, although it's voluminous, and we know that it's a dynamic system, that as the disease progresses, much like a storm system progresses in its behavior, we will learn more and these models will become less and less divergent and more clear in terms of trajectory. And so I think that's really important to recognize when we talk about any of the data and analytic tasks in front of us and managing this crisis that we are not building static solutions. We're building dynamic solutions that will continue to be optimized over time in a way that's not dissimilar from what we do uh, when we deal with weather forecasting data. So how do we take all those problems and this dynamic system and turn that into sort of an approach that a health system like ours can uh, execute on? So we really came down to what we considered sort of our foundational data products. And you can see here sort of those pillars. I won't read all of the sort of text on this slide, but I will point out that these pillars really resolve to three critical questions that we have to be able to answer uh, at any point in time, which are what's happening in the health system today? How many patients do I have? How severely ill are they? And do I have the right resources and understanding of how to take care of those individuals? The second question is, are there meaningful trends in our data that we can use to inform the way in which we diagnose and treat those patients, especially as those data sets grow and mature over time? And then lastly, what do we think is going to happen next, particularly at a regional level? How do we fit into, as a healthcare provider organization, the broader sort of environment, the system at a regional level that we operate in? Because unlike traditional healthcare operations, we can't actually afford to be positioned as a competitor to other healthcare systems in the region. We have to work in a highly coordinated and integrated manner with all the healthcare provider organizations and public health organizations to achieve what we need to do for the population. So this is an example of one of those tools that we've been building through this joint group. In this case, this is a dashboard that we use for our senior decision makers within uh, the healthcare delivery system that allows us at a glance to understand what's going on in our healthcare delivery system. Back to that first question. You know, how many patients are in our various facilities that are COVID positive or are under investigation, what we call PUIs? Um, what's the overall census of the hospital? How many patients do we have? Um, how many of these patients are in the ICU or on ventilators? ventilators? Um, what is our supply chain status? Cumulatively, what is the positive test rate for individuals where we are conducting COVID testing through our clinical labs? 
And the practical reality with this uh, sort of dashboard is while this all seems like data that should be readily at hand, there's a huge data integration task that lies underneath this because the data lives in a variety of enterprise systems and one-off systems and gap filling systems. And we need to bring this together in real time, visualize it and understand it and make sure that we can stand behind those measures that they're appropriately defined and justified so that our decision makers can have confidence in using this type of information to inform that most basic form of precision medicine, making sure we have the right providers and the right resources and the right time and place to take care of the patients that we serve. Another big thing that we do is build, as I alluded to earlier, uh, epidemiologic models of the disease. And this is work that's led by our Center for Clinical Excellence, working with the other major healthcare delivery systems in the region, all coordinated through the St. Louis Pandemic Task Force. And here, what you actually see is a model, and this is actually from yesterday's uh, update to that model, that shows two different scenarios as to what we anticipate in uh, terms of an initial patient surge. So what you see is the orange line, which is a worst case scenario based on a polynomial growth curve for likely cases in the region, informed by data from a variety of international locations and domestically where there's more experience with the disease. And then the blue line is actually what we call our best case scenario, which is based on a derivation of what's called an SIR model, a more parameterized and rule-based model that's used in infectious disease uh, management, in this case built by Elvin Gang and colleagues in our Division of Infectious Diseases that gives us sort of a more reasonable uh, expectation based on local behaviors of our population, our health systems. And what you can actually see from this in terms of the overall St. Louis metropolitan area is that we have been able to produce these models and have tracked at or below um, our reasonable best case model for some time. Now, I want to point out that while that looks fantastic, this is still a tremendous number of sick patients that we are taking care of at an unprecedented time. We're very thankful uh, that we didn't track closer to the orange line, the worst case scenario, which could have uh, been a very uh, substantial challenge to the capacity of our health systems. But I would point out that as social distancing has worked in our region, what we've done is extended the time period of this peak number of patients in our best case scenario. That means we have the healthcare resources to take care of those individuals, but that peak is going to last longer. And that's sort of the essential trade-off of sort of flattening the curve as it's often referred to. Perhaps even more important part of these models is when we look at how many of those patients do we expect to be critically ill? right, and uh, admitted to the ICU because this is one of our most finite resources. And here you can see uh, early on, we did not track as close to our reasonable best case model, but over time we've actually tracked closer and now below that reasonable best case model. And these numbers continue to drop. I would actually point out that we're now evaluating a number of other features in these models as to the likely outcomes and how we can predict them for patients in the ICU. And I'll come back to that in a moment as well. Now, the next question that we're being asked is, given those near-term models, which we are fairly comfortable producing, can we now engage in planning scenarios where we simulate longer range data and anticipate what does the disease curve look like two or three or six or 12 months out? And this is central to the questions around how do we actually reopen our economy, right? How do we get back to some new normal uh, in light of this virus? So this is an example of one of those long range models, again, produced by our colleagues at the Center for Clinical Excellence, that actually predicts overall inpatient census for COVID positive patients in our metropolitan area using that same SIR model that I described earlier for our best case scenario. And what it actually shows is sort of the peak that we're tracking towards and then a long gradual decline. However, this model, as you see here, does not anticipate the changes that may occur as we relax social distancing or engage in more interaction at a population level. There are variations on this model where we can insert a number of different assumptions around what that looks like. Uh, this is actually what it would look like uh, in more granular detail if the reproducing uh, rate of the disease, right, the, the frequency with which it is communicated between uh, various individuals maintains a relatively stable uh, behavior as we currently see now, uh, and that we have precision approaches to quarantine where new hotspots occur. And what do you see? Well, you basically imagine now what is not really as nearly a steep of a decline as we saw in the increase, but really rather a long, slow decline. And this is assuming, again, that we can keep that RE value, right, the rate with which the virus reproduces below one, right? So an individual that's sick with the disease does not pass the disease on to more than one individual, which is why quarantine becomes so important. 
There's also sort of scenarios where perhaps we have a second peak of individuals that is much larger than our current peak uh, if we completely relax uh, social distancing uh, and we do not have sort of appropriate tools for precision quarantining. So this is sort of um, what we may refer to as the light switch model and that we just turn off all the public health measures that we currently have in place and go back to sort of normal behaviors. And again, all of these are underpinned by a tremendous amount of data, both locally and internationally that we use in conjunction with these sort of modeling approaches to anticipate these outcomes. And they inform a lot of important policy decisions. Another dimension of the work that we have to do is more in the visual analytics space. And this is work led by my colleague, Randy Foraker in the Center for Population Health Informatics, where we've started to dig into what does the incidence of COVID look like at a geospatial level? And in this case, you can see sort of an intense cluster of cases in the North City area of the St. Louis MSA. I think many of you have probably read that we're seeing a disproportionate impact of this disease on some of our most socioeconomically disadvantaged communities. And actually this uh, cluster that you see in the northern part of the metropolitan uh, sort of St. Louis area is consistent with exactly those features. And unfortunately speaks to sort of the fact that this disease is tracking very close to a number of the sort of longstanding inequities that we know sort of define uh, the metropolitan St. Louis area and unfortunately result in uh, far worse outcomes for some of our most vulnerable populations in the community. I think perhaps even more interestingly, when we think about this geospatially, and this is another example of the work that we're engaged in, we start to get into the issue of, can we see changes over time in the incidence of not only COVID, but also other types of diseases that may or may not track with COVID. In this case, influenza-like illnesses, right? The common flu and other respiratory viruses. And here, what you see is actually a density map that shows sort of change over time, uh, incorporating both those influenza-like illnesses as well as COVID testing and can kind of show you where sort of the sort of center of gravity, if you would, for some of these disease outbreaks sits. Um, this is actually, uh, if you were to use it uh, in a sort of real-time manner, a dynamic map that allows you to see the change in these densities over time, going all the way back to the beginning of March. So you can actually see sort of the evolution of disease incidence geospatially in the region. And, you know, in many ways, while not trying to oversell the potential of this approach, we think of this as not being dissimilar from the cholera maps that were used in Victorian London to understand sort of the spread of one of the earliest examples of a disease that was actually uh, really sort of mitigated through epidemiology epidemiologic practice. I also talked about the fact that we need to understand patient trajectory. So now going from the population level, I want to come back down to individual patients. So this is an example of work being led by uh, Sean Yu, a graduate student in the Institute for Informatics, as well as Andrew Michelson, a joint faculty member who's also a critical care physician taking care of COVID patients in our ICUs. Um, and this is an effort to build trajectory models that allow us to understand for patients coming into our healthcare system, depending on where they enter the system and the types of transitions or treatments that they receive, how does that impact sort of critical outcomes such as mortality, likelihood of being intubated and put on mechanical ventilation or requiring dialysis support? So here what you actually see is a group of individuals that we are looking at a variety of factors that correlate with likely outcome, in this case, mortality, everything from what service they were admitted on to which medications they were given to various uh, racial, ethnic, and other demographic uh, dynamics. And you can actually see on the bottom half of the display in real time filtered upon uh, that pathway, what are the relative odds ratios of different features of those patients that contribute to their likelihood of mortality, right? So things that we are familiar with in the common discussion around COVID, such as age and body mass index, but also things like comorbidity scores that look at overall health status, cardiovascular disease, depression, valve disease, et cetera. So the takeaway is this allows us in a visual way where we don't have sufficient data to engage in traditional machine learning to start to ascertain potential hypotheses as to patterns in the data by filtering and understanding visually what these trajectories for patients are. Now, the next big challenge in front of us, and this is sort of the final part of my talk before we get to the Q&A, um, is how do we transition from the stage where we're applying analytics to take care of our patients in the inpatient environment to a world in which we are trying to precisely intervene at a population level and prevent spread of disease before people become critically ill and require hospitalization? So one of the key issues to be addressed in that regard is public health practice. Things like case management, contact tracing, as well as symptom tracking for those individuals that have been exposed. 
So one of the things that we've been doing in addition to our work within the healthcare delivery system is partnering with St. Louis uh, County's Department of Public Health to start building a set of data capture instruments that will allow them to engage in this work at scale with the entire population of the region. And here you can actually see sort of an enumeration of various types of databases and data capture instruments that we can use. And actually you can drill down. This is an example of a symptom log whereby an individual could actually report their symptoms as they're being tracked by uh, the public health department, either themselves or through phone or other interactions with public health workers. And this is about building the data sets that allow us to intervene and understand the spread of disease in the community at scale and therefore control for uh, the reproduction of COVID-19, uh, going back to those sort of post-surge models that I talked about earlier. But what this really has to be is part of a broader sort of public health informatics ecosystem that doesn't really exist right now. And this is one of the biggest challenges in front of us and a big part of the work that we're now doing with the pandemic task force. So this is, if nothing else, a diagram that proves the fact that no informatician could put together a slide deck that doesn't have a diagram with a lot of boxes and lines in it. But the actual reality is this is showing sort of a future state that we need to work towards in short order that allows us to address really four critical quadrants of public health data management need. The first is that we need to make sure that our public health workers have near real time notification of new cases so that they can engage in interaction with those individuals in the community. Then they need the tools to engage in case management, symptom tracking and contact tracing as I alluded to earlier. Basic public health practice where they can interact with those individuals, find out who have they interacted with, what are their symptoms, do they need to be quarantined for some period of time. The third big bucket is that we're going to have to augment that traditional public health practice with things like mobile technologies to make sure that this scales, because we will never have enough human beings to work in the county or city public health departments to do all this work alone. We also should not be Pollyannish and believe that every single patient is going to choose to self-report their data through their mobile devices. So it's really a combination of those things. And then finally, we need to put all those data assets together in some sort of data commons that allows us to create situational awareness for our decision makers so they can then make smart choices about do we open schools, do we open restaurants, do we open businesses based on the current behavior in the community. So it's really about the problems that we need to solve for and the outcomes that we're trying to get to, which are improved speed and efficiency and decreased time to insight in order to make data-driven public health decisions. And so that's really gonna involve us working across all of the regional public health departments, bringing their data together uh, through some form of regional data commons that can be brokered so that data is truly shareable across all those entities because it turns out people move across the region and therefore we need to track the data in a holistic manner. As I talked about before, that also involves the need for a shared mobile platform. Ideally, we're not gonna deploy five mobile platforms, but we're gonna have one mobile platform that we can use in the region to allow for that augmentation I talked about before. And that our labs, healthcare provider organizations, and public health agencies are gonna share in that data and create analytics tools, not dissimilar to what I showed for BJC and WashU, that will allow for data-driven decision-making. Now, one of the great things, and I saw that uh, my colleague Ben Cooper's on the call today, we are fortunate that we have a group called the Regional Data Alliance that has a history of working with our Institute for Public Health at Washington University that's ideally, ideally positioned to tackle some of these issues around building a regional data commons. And we're already doing a lot of that honest brokering work for the healthcare provider organizations today to allow us to build those shared epidemiologic models that I uh, had shown you a few slides ago. So really, we want to build on that momentum with that collaboration around data data and move that on to sort of the next uh, step in terms of public health practice. So then lastly, I just want to talk about how do we scale all that to the national level beyond the region itself, because we need more data than we have in the St. Louis MSA. So simultaneously, we're working with the National Institutes of Health, with Microsoft, a number of startup companies, and academic health centers throughout the country to build a synthetic data resource. So this is simulated clinical data that statistically is identical to real clinical data but does not have the privacy and confidentiality risk and will be available to companies, citizen scientists, healthcare delivery systems, and academic researchers alike. 
And we're very fortunate that both Microsoft and the NIH have come forward and are providing resources to allow us to stand this environment up. And this is something that Washington University, working with a startup company that was brought to the region by our colleagues at Global STL, this company is named MD Clone, and they're based out of Israel, are going to be leading as a national solution to enabling data sharing at scale across the United States for benchmarking, epidemiologic modeling, and artificial intelligence-based approaches to understanding patient trajectory in COVID-19. And so I would say stay tuned for details. We anticipate sort of the launch of this initial network in the next 30 to 60 days, if not sooner. Uh, and a lot of work is going on right now to build this resource because we all desperately need to be able to share this data at scale nationally while protecting the privacy and confidentiality of our patients, which is a very complex challenge, but entirely achievable if we use the right technologies and informatics approaches. Now, I couldn't help but one shameless plug as I wrap things up as an academic. We have already published a paper on some of our initial lessons learned around adapting informatics practice uh, for use in a pandemic. So if you wanna learn more about some of the things I talked about today, take a look. This is actually open access available through the Journal of the American Medical Informatics Association. And one of the things I wanna point out, showing how things have changed in the, just the last uh, several weeks, if you were to click on the article history, never in my entire career have I ever seen a publication accepted so quickly. This was reviewed and accepted in 48 hours between submission and uh, acceptance decision. That's never happened. And I think it speaks to that fast moving pace of sort of the current state of affairs. So to wrap up, what have we learned so far trying to apply data and informatics uh, sort of methods to improve our response to the COVID epidemic? Uh, well, we figured out that we have to work together across traditional disciplinary boundaries, industry, healthcare providers, academic organizations, community members, public health agencies, to not only mitigate barriers to data sharing and analytics, but also fill data management gaps. That example I gave of the public health data capture instruments is a real-time development projects that we have been undertaking with St. Louis County, simply because those tools need to be built today, not a month from now, not six months from now, but in a matter of just a couple of weeks. Second is we know that we're not the only people facing these challenges and there's great value in collaboration. So you wanna develop things that make sense locally, but then share them regionally and nationally and vice versa, adopt or adapt whatever our regional and national partners are producing. We also wanna make sure that we're adapting and not building anew, whether that be mobile contact tracing or the functionality that we deploy in our electronic health records and all of the stops in between. How do we make sure that we are not reinventing the wheel? Um, we need to make sure that we deliver sort of knowledge in the right time and place, uh, the sort of data that we're talking about. And then finally, we need to make sure that we don't lose sight of the need to not only take care of clinical operations, but also support an evolving research and innovation enterprise that's trying to react to sort of this unprecedented challenge because we only get to those new therapies, vaccines and preventative measures by also doing research in conjunction with taking care of these critically ill patients. So with that, I wanna wrap up by saying, uh, I presented a lot of work here uh, that is actually the result of an extraordinary team-based uh, effort spanning BJC, WashU, and a number of other partners in the region. And this is just sort of a snapshot, and I'm sure I've left some critical people out uh, of this slide of the extraordinary team that's come together and has literally been working 24 seven for the past month to, be able to deliver a lot of the uh, resources that I talked about uh, today. So I really wanna make sure that I give them all more than adequate credit. Uh, I think my biggest uh, contribution so far has been to organize meeting agendas and present PowerPoints, but this is the team that's really doing the bulk of the work. Um, and with that, I would just encourage you, if you wanna learn more about our Institute for Informatics, take a look at our website. Uh, you can always email me and, um, if you look on Twitter, I've been posting uh, during uh, the week a sort of top lessons learned on a daily basis, uh, sort of summary from our joint analytics team, as well as a synopsis of the uh, uh, pandemic task force numbers. So if you wanna see what's going on in our world, uh, that information is available on Twitter. And with that, I think we can transition to more of a Q&A. Yeah, that's excellent, Philip. Thank you so much. It's very good information. We've got a few questions coming in already uh, through the, the chat in the Zoom. So we'll start with those and if others have any, you know, feel free to, to add on those. Cindy and I are checking those out now. Sure. Uh, so Tim Rooney, Rooney says, and, and if you want to be anonymous, identify yourself as such, but uh, Tim Rooney and Ben Cooper, we got your names now first. So uh, Tim Rooney says, this is all amazing. Thank you for your work on this. Regarding, regarding mobile technologies with Apple and Google working on their contact tracing solutions, Will you be able to leverage those data sources? I think you talked a little bit about wanting to do that. 
Yeah. So it's a great question. Um, we actually have been in contact uh, with Apple and Google as well as with Microsoft about the work that they are engaged in, in this space. And we're aggressively pursuing those opportunities. Um, one of the challenges is that the work that's been done to date uh, has largely around uh, focused around building the frameworks that are privacy conserving to make these mobile applications work. Um, what is sort of uh, both a challenge and opportunity there is that we need to be able to deploy these technologies in the next, you know, four to six weeks if we're going to have an impact on the post surge sort of uh, outcomes for the region. So we've been exploring both what we can do with industry, but also we've been looking at some open source solutions. So for example, uh, the software toolkit that the platform Apple and Google are working on uh, is derived from, actually came from MIT, uh, and that is a tool that's available uh, for rollout today. So my assumption is it will be some aggregate of both working with those companies and working with some of the open source solutions. But our goal is to move as quickly and expediently as possible to allow people, as I like to say, to basically donate their data to help us fight COVID. Not dissimilar from when we ask people to donate their organs, right? This is an opportunity for every citizen to contribute to our ability. Uh, and of course, it's something that they need to do voluntarily and we need to get them the tools to be able to do that as soon as possible. So follow up question to that, you know, in the same way that, you know, Google traffic on their maps builds a, a pattern of, hey, here's the red traffic, here's the light green traffic, just from a, a subset, a sample of all the cars that are on the road. Uh, do you have any idea how much is enough? Like if we're going to paint the, the right picture, is it aggregate enough or, or is it so lumpy and segmented that some people's data is much more important than others and how yeah. much would we need? Do you have any thoughts on that? So it's interesting. I think one of the real questions, especially if we think about our ability to get data directly from, uh, you know, individual citizens and use that to inform these models is what is the sampling of the broader population that those individuals who volunteer their data represents? Um, and I mentioned earlier that we see sort of disproportionate impact in certain areas and certain demographic strata of the city. And so in order for this data to be helpful to us in sort of predicting the next outbreak, we're going to need reasonable sampling of all of those communities. And so that will drive our ability to say, when is there enough data? Now, that being said, I want to say that we are in the early planning stages of doing some larger prevalence uh, studies here in the St. Louis region beyond those people that have been hospitalized to understand how many people in the region truly have been infected and perhaps were asymptomatic and did not know that they had COVID because that will actually be very helpful to us in then estimating the answer to your question, Dave, uh, you know, is a, do we have enough data in hand to do that analysis? So we need to know the prevalence of the virus in the community and how that correlates with the sampling of people volunteering data before we can really make those decisions. Um, but that being said, I will also tell you, we don't need all the data from the region. We don't need 100% participation. We can sample data and the methods that we're using will allow for us to do that because we need to be realistic and pragmatic that you know we will have to make these types of assessments in light of incomplete uh, data in sort of the broadest possible sense. Okay. Uh, so another question is from Ben Cooper. He says, to yeah. a large extent, health information exchanges have already done much of the heavy lifting around data aggregation across healthcare systems and facilities. How are we working with Missouri HIEs during this pandemic? Yeah, so um, I saw that question pop up earlier, Ben, and it's a great question. So we are working very closely with all four HIEs in the state, as well as coordinating with the governor's office to identify how we could best leverage that infrastructure. What's interesting is that the HIEs in the state um, were not really designed with this type of epidemiologic uh, use case in mind. And so they have a lot of valuable data and we are leveraging to the extent possible those data assets, but they don't have all of the data that we need in order to uh, sort of solve this problem. So we're really having to think of them as part of the solution, sort of an information backbone at the state level that needs to be uh, then uh, augmented with some of the other data we get from testing laboratories, from patient reporting, and from the healthcare provider organizations. So, um, you know, I'd love to say that we could solve all of our problems using data from our uh, HIE platforms. But again, um, I think like many HIEs, they are very good at uh, sort of what they were designed to do and they have the potential to meet these evolving challenges. And it's just a matter of how do we help them to evolve? 
Um, I will say that the HIE organizations have been incredibly engaged and extremely collaborative in terms of navigating this. And we're very grateful to all of them. Uh, and it's one of the things that I think over time uh, and one of the critical lessons learned for the region, uh, it will be that if anything, we need to redouble our investment uh, in HIEs and sort of the underlying technologies to make sure that the next time we face a challenge like this, the sort of uh, data aggregation and analytics needs will be much less acute. Um, so I hope that we I hope that we learn that lesson and continue to invest in those critical platforms moving forward. Awesome. For people who aren't familiar, the HIEs are, I, I see, is sort of a, uh, explanatory questions. They're health information exchanges. So they are organizations that help to connect uh, multiple healthcare provider organizations so we can answer questions like, given a patient that I take care of in my primary care practice, did they uh, seek emergency care at another hospital because they had a car accident and what happened to them? This is sort of a, uh, you know, sort of prototypical use case so that data can flow back and forth across the provider organizations and we can create some efficiencies. Great. Hey, Philip, will you be able to share this deck when we... Yeah, so I will be able to share a version of this deck uh, for everybody. Yep. Awesome. We'll do that and we'll send out the link to the, to the deck and the, uh, your paper as well after yep. the call here. Um, another question from Davis Walp says, uh, great discussion, Philip. Can you comment on the extent to which you're leveraging social media analytics, Google search trends, Twitter, all those types of things in developing leading indicators or parameters for your EPI modeling? Yeah, so we have been exploring that. You know, it's interesting that um, one of the problems is there's a lot of sampling bias issues in uh, Twitter. I'm sure if anyone has followed any of the trending around COVID-19, you'll find that uh, Twitter uh, is definitely a great source for worst case scenario uh, outcomes for people who are infected, hospitalized, et cetera. And there's important data and signals to be found in that. I don't want to dismiss that at all. Um, but so far, uh, you know, what we see nationally is that um, the social media analytics have not really sort of tracked the sort of distribution of sort of severity or outcomes that we've seen, right? So case in point, if you were to track what is found in social media, you would assume that hospitalization, uh, complication, and mortality rates are considerably higher. And there's been some studies done by some of my colleagues at a number of other institutions that have shown that. Um, that being said, we are very interested in this, in particular uh, as a vehicle to sort of uh, get critical signals around sort of social behaviors that may influence spread of disease over time. Um, and I would uh, argue that a lot of our expertise at Washington University actually sits in both the Brown School as well as in our business school and uh, School of Engineering, and we're really trying to leverage those um, capabilities. But uh, right now, uh, we're not using any signals directly extracted from social media to drive any of our sort of operational near-term uh, decision-making. Okay. Let's see. So the next question is from Robert Russell. He says, fantastic presentation. Thank you. Have your projection models been shared with local and state government officials? If so, was it well received? What challenges do you anticipate with regard to your models and the economy returning to normal? Right. So I think that um, the one thing that I've been most proud of is that the groups uh, that have come together in the region uh, have been incredibly collaborative when it comes to the epidemiologic models. And I mentioned earlier that the major healthcare providers, in addition to BJC and WashU, uh, SSM, SLU, Mercy, as well as uh, a number of other providers, uh, St. Luke's have all come together and not only shared critical data to inform these models, but have worked uh, conjointly on the model formulation and optimization. And then they're shared across all those systems and with the Metro Pandemic Task Force. And then we share all that modeling information with the state, uh, both from uh, the perspective of uh, the public health uh, sort of uh, entities within the state government as well as with the governor's office. And then we share them with all of the local public health agencies as well. So we've been very transparent with the modeling. And I think um, they have been well received. I think Early on, there was some um, concern about, you know, uh, whether or not the tracking of our local data, at least in the metropolitan area, being so close to our best case uh, scenario was convenient or an actual indication of sort of the uh, behavior of the disease. Because there's sort of this general thinking in the epidemiologic modeling space that you sort of move along this sort of um, 
sort of polynomial growth curve. And then if things uh, are progressing in a less than ideal way, you will actually shift over to more of a quadratic uh, growth curve. So it's sort of the hockey stick model if you thought about it in, in startup terms. And that's very scary. And I think a lot of people were worried, you know, are we just sort of, uh, you know, naive to the fact that we're going to have one of those inflection points and move into a hockey stick like growth curve. Luckily, that hasn't happened. Um, and we have really tried to optimize the model with all the data that we have. Um, I will tell you that the challenge with the economy returning to normal is the next step. I talked about those longer term models, right? How do we relax some of the public health policy in a way that allows the economy to return to normal, get people back to work, you know, open up, uh, you know, certain types of businesses and schools, uh, as well as sort of community activities. And that is important and a very critical goal. But as we model looking forward, we have to do that based on a set of scenarios, right? We have to hypothesize what uh, the likely outcomes are based on different policy decisions uh, that may be made and then sort of build those different scenarios. So whereas in the near term, we can say this is the best and worst case curve and here's where we're at. When we go to the next step, how do we look three, six, 12 months down range? We're really involved in what I like to refer to as storytelling with data, which we have to sort of lay, um, lay out you know, here are the three or four scenarios that we're considering and how they impact that long-term uh, sort of trajectory and therefore what decisions are safe to make versus which uh, we may want to consider uh, more carefully. That goes back to my metaphor about the hurricane maps, uh, which is, you know, we are going to have to accept some degree of uncertainty until we understand how the various scenarios and decisions actually play out in the population and then the models will get better over time. And that's a tough conversation to have because everyone wants an answer today appropriately and it's totally understood. But, you know, this approach is really without precedence. We have no prior experience doing something like what we're doing today to inform uh, sort of how we do those projections. So, uh, my other favorite metaphor is that it's like building an airplane in mid-flight, right? We've taken off and we're not sure of the destination and we're building the landing gear as we're flying the airplane. Another oh, startup analogy. <laughs> yes. I could just keep on using metaphors for all the Q&A. But... Sounds good. Um, let's see. So there's a question here from Jay Duncan. What does early planning mean for the broader testing program? Does that mean weeks out, months out? And another follow-up on the app tracking ecosystem. In your circles, do you feel the region is moving forward on a common system? Is there hope for something harmonized nationally? Yeah, so, um, so I, uh, to talk about testing, I think the real challenge is that we are all quite eager to see an increase in test volume. And it is a convergence of a lot of different factors. So it's a convergence of uh, sort of our ability to trust the various testing modalities, right? And there's more than one way to test for the disease right now. Uh, you know, PCR-based testing versus serological testing and a number of, you know, sort of traditional versus rapid testing, you know, instruments and kits. Um, one of the things that's happening right now at Washington University is our Department of Pathology is doing a sizable volume of testing, not only for the BJC healthcare system, but also for the region for other healthcare provider organizations. And they've been very diligent in evaluating those tests because while we want to increase testing capacity, we don't want to do that at the expense of sort of suboptimal sensitivity or specificity of those tests. So there's a lot of work to be done to validate all of these new technologies that are coming out literally every day. Second big factor is supply chain, right? So one of our biggest uh, challenges is not necessarily knowing how to do the test or having the equipment or the personnel, but actually having the supplies, the reagents, the swabs, the other pieces that are necessary to administer the test. And, you know, our supply chain team at BJC has been working 24-7 uh, since this started uh, to secure all the resources we can. And that's a big challenge and will continue to be a challenge that limits uh, scaling. Um, I think the reality is that if you want to get to widespread testing in the community, we will probably need different testing technologies and different supply chains than we currently have right now. And it's why we can't really answer the question around widespread testing, because uh, we don't know uh, what that supply chain and testing sort of environment is going to look like at the end of this week, let alone next month. But I can tell you the question that we are asked over and over is, how can we scale to a sufficient amount of testing to enable people to return to work and to school? And that is the big focus of the major health systems as well as the commercial labs uh, working with the pandemic task force. So I wish I could give you a time range. I would love to be able to do it, um, but I can't mainly because of that sort of myriad of factors I just described. 
Um, I'm hopeful that when we do this larger prevalence study in the region and we know how many people have truly been exposed to the virus, it will tell us a lot more about what testing capacity we need. But we certainly don't have the testing capacity we need and we're gonna have to keep on uh, building it every day. Um, I will say in a moment of sort of institutional pride, if you were to look back two weeks ago, we were able to do about 200 tests a day at BJC, and now we can do about 800 tests a day. Um, it's certainly not uh, sort of anywhere near where we need to be, but that is a tremendous amount of growth in a very short time period uh, in terms of validating those testing modalities, getting the reagents, training the staff, and delivering those tests. Mm. Um, as it relates to sort of the broader app tracking ecosystem, I think the good news is there is some pretty strong convergence around sort of a set of frameworks uh, as a result of the work by Apple, Google, and Microsoft that are privacy conserving and take advantage of the technologies that are sort of baked in to most of the mobile devices that all of us are carrying around in our pockets. And I think uh, that will uh, be a forcing function for the adoption of those standards at a national level, which I think is really important. Um, I'm committed here uh, through the work that we're doing with the Pandemic Task Force to make sure that we have a common approach in the region because I think it behooves us to have that. And I don't think anybody should be under any dispersion. The St. Louis metropolitan area has done a tremendous job of organizing its response to this virus, to sharing data, to making smart public health decisions, and to operating in an integrated and coordinated manner. And that's why we flatten the curve and why we see the numbers that we do and why we've been able to track so closely to that best case scenario. And so our next steps from a public health standpoint, from a, you know, a citizen engagement standpoint, from a policy standpoint will require us to continue to do exactly that. That's why we've been successful and we should be proud of that. Uh, but we need to stay committed to that degree of coordination, which includes, you know, not reproducing, you know, uh, a dozen different solutions to sort of the critical public health data management tasks that are in front of us. Excellent. I think maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, Cindy, we've got time for maybe one more question here. Um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, two, maybe two. Okay, so um, so this is kind of a combined question. Uh, Ann Trollard and Patrick Shields are asking about the, the St. Louis specific dashboards and visualizations that you showed. Uh, they're saying that it would be very, very useful at the uh, community level for community partners that are doing local work and, and you know, who is, who is at risk and who's not at risk and the different levels. Are there links, is that publicly available, those dashboards? So um, the short answer is, and Anne's raising a really good question. So the short answer is, you know, much of the epidemiologic modeling and underlying data is available through the pandemic task force. And there are is now uh, an epidemiologic strike force that's been organized underneath that that includes community partners working alongside uh, sort of the health systems and the public health agencies. And I think the goal is to be as inclusive as possible. We are constantly identifying new partners that need to be at the table. Um, and so I think in, you know, uh, knowing sort of your commitment to this area, I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to, you know, work together to make sure that those individuals are fully engaged. Some of the information that I shared is sort of examples of internal data uh, that's used in our health system and there's similar products at SSM and Mercy. And we are working very hard to figure out how to share that data in a way that respects patient privacy and confidentiality uh, that has enough context and can be shareable. And that's not about trying to be, uh, you know, uh, challenging around sharing the data, but making sure that we share the data in a, region, in a a very responsible way. And then the last thing is my colleague, uh, Randy Forker, working with Ben Cooper and the folks at the Regional Data Alliance, we are talking every week around how we can better leverage that entity to make these data assets more widely available to all the people that need them. Um, so I'm very committed to getting the data into the hands of all the people that need them. And anytime somebody in the community says, you know, I'm not at the table, then I think, you know, Randy, myself, all the members of sort of the community of practice that are focused on these problems want to hear from those groups so we can make sure to get them engaged. Great, thank you. And I, I would say, you know, anyone on the call who um, wants to be engaged, as Philip said, you know, reach out to us, um, reach out to Philip, he's got his information here on the screen. Um, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. It's 1259. So, um, Philip, thank you so much. I know your schedule must be so crazy right now. And it means a lot uh, that you and that the university are willing to take time uh, with, you know, the general population and uh, organizations like Prepare, and and I'm also so grateful to all the attendees. We had a great turnout today. Um, thanks for all the questions. Uh, again, we will be sending out a follow-up email. It will have the video to this webinar, so you can share it with friends, family, colleagues. 
Um, we will include a link to the paper that Philip mentioned that was published recently, um, as well as the slide deck that, um, that Philip is able to share. So thank you all again, and we hope to see you in two weeks for our next session. Have a great afternoon, everyone, especially you, Philip. Great, thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.